Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in our series of ENA Center for Transportation webinars. I hope everybody is staying healthy and safe at home. Today we are going to be discussing transit during and after COVID-19 with Dylan Twombly of VIA and Dr. Joshua Schenk of LA Metro. Dylan is the Chief Revenue Officer for VIA and before joining VIA, Dylan held senior leadership positions at Data Miner, MetLife, and a political risk consulting boutique. Prior to the private sector, Dylan completed uh, three field tours in an as an operations officer with the CIA. Dylan is a former team term member of, at the Council of Foreign Relations and a founding member of the Ambassador Council at the International Crisis Group. Joshua Shank is the first ever Chief Innovation Officer for the Los Angeles County Metro, and he is the former President and CEO of the ENO Center for Transportation. Dr. Shank has worked on federal and state transportation policy for over a decade, including as a transportation policy advisor to Senator Hillary Clinton during the development of Safety Lou. He has also worked as a consultant with PV and as a senior associate at ICF International here in Washington, as well as uh, at the Office of the Inspector Generals at the US DOT and with the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee of the MTA in New York City. Today, Dylan and Joshua will discuss what their organizations are doing to respond to the changing needs around travel behavior, physical distancing, sanitation, and tighter budgets in response to the current pandemic. We'll have plenty of time for questions throughout the webinar, uh, and I invite everybody who's listening to please feel free to enter your questions at any time in the question box on the side of your screen, and we will get to as many as possible. So we're just gonna start off um, with a little bit from Joshua and then Dylan, and then we will go into questions and conversation. So I will hand it over to you, Joshua. Great, well, thank you, um, and thanks for having me. Uh, the, the first thing to know about uh, Metro is that we are not your typical transportation agency to begin with, right? So we, we do operate uh, public transit. We also build it, uh, but we also plan and fund it. So we have a very wide mandate for LA County, which has about 11 million people in it, uh, larger than 42 states. Uh, and the largest county in the U.S. So it's, it's an unusual agency. And we, even before this pandemic, we were already looking at transportation differently than most public transit agencies because we considered our role to be mobility, not public transit. And in many ways, that big picture that we were looking for uh, prior to the pandemic has only become more true now. Uh, because if we were to focus only on public transit as being the goal uh, and getting people to ride public transit as being the goal, we'd be missing a lot of the bigger picture when it comes to what we're trying to accomplish in LA County coming out of this pandemic. Um, and the second thing that you have to recognize about LA, and I think this is true in many metropolitan areas across the country, is that the status quo that we had prior to this pandemic was unacceptable in many respects. Um, it was a highly inequitable system uh, in, in Los Angeles. The vast majority of people on public transit um, are getting worse service than people who are in cars and are far lower income than people who are in cars. Um, and it was a system that didn't work particularly well for the people who do have cars, um, as we had the worst traffic in, in the entire country. And so the desire to return back to where we were is really low. And with that in mind, we created this recovery task force within Metro that is intended to say, well, rather than return to the status quo, what can we do very differently coming out of this to return to something that is better than what we had previously, um, since not to very many people were happy with what we had previously. And so uh, the Office of Extraordinary Innovation is leading the recovery task force because the recovery task force is fundamentally about change. It's, it's about doing something different. And I think there are three key things that we're looking to do as we come out of this. Um, and I would put those into the categories of uh, being flexible, uh, creating a, a more equitable transportation system, and contributing to the economic recovery. So I'll talk about each of those three and then and then I'll let uh, Dylan talk about uh, some of the things that, that VIA is doing. But the first thing I want to talk about is how we're working with VIA and, and how other and other private mobility companies, and that's where the flexibility part comes in. We immediately worked with VIA 
to alter our service in response to this pandemic in a way that we couldn't do with other services because they don't have that flexibility. We now are using our, our current partnership with VIA not only to help essential workers get to their jobs in more, more ways than we were before, but also uh, to help deliver food to people who can't go out to food banks at the moment and get it. Um, so the most needy members of society are now getting food with this service. So that's the kind of flexibility you can have when you work with private mobility providers who are able to adjust to changing circumstances much more quickly than we would with traditional services. Um, and a second thing we're doing is we're thinking about, well, that was great, and maybe we need to have more of those types of partnerships as we emerge from this pandemic, because, well, one thing, one thing we know is that we're gonna have to remain flexible. We don't know how this is gonna end up. We don't know what the scenario is gonna be in a year and two years. So having that flexibility is gonna be critical. All right, second thing, equity. We had a very inequitable system, as I mentioned earlier. And one of the main reasons it's inequitable is that the vast majority of our riders, we have about 1.3 a day, 1.3 million a day before this pandemic, the vast majority of them are on buses, and the vast majority of those buses are stuck in the very same traffic that all the cars are stuck in. And that means that their commutes are even worse because they have to deal with waiting for buses, riding on buses, changing buses, walking places, and all that traffic. Um, so it's a very challenging situation. One of the ways we can alleviate that is by putting in more exclusive bus lanes and doing it now before people notice, which is something that we've been talking with the cities in LA County about, because now is the time to get those vehicles uh, with their own lanes so that when we emerge from this, um, they are continuing to be able to do that. And secondly, to think about how are we funding our system and are we doing it in the most equitable way? Right now we rely primarily on sales taxes, but sales taxes are kind of a regressive tax. And are there more progressive funding measures that we could implement that would better uh, serve our population? There's some ideas we've been tossing around of vehicle registration fees, but there's lots of other ways you could do this that uh, congestion pricing is another one that could potentially fund the system in a more progressive way. And then finally, uh, recovery. Uh, we build a lot of projects and people often think, okay, how do we put back people back to work? Let's build more projects. And there's some truth to that, but the truth is that the way that we build our projects, it takes a very long time because there is a tremendous emphasis on trying to build uh, rail projects, first of all, uh, rather than bus projects. And secondly, uh, because of a very uh, cumbersome environmental process, uh, CEQA, which is laid on top of the federal process in our case. So we're looking at how we can streamline some of those processes, but also how we can rescope some of these projects that we have to get them built faster so that we don't have to wait for those benefits to accrue. And to think about what kind of projects we should be building that we weren't thinking about before. You know, bike ridership in Los Angeles on our bike share system has come back faster than transit ridership. And perhaps that's something that people are going to be more open to as we move forward and maybe biking infrastructure should be more of a focus than transit infrastructure coming out of the pandemic. These are the types of things we're thinking about. It's highly unorthodox for a transit agency to be talking about ways we can get people around without uh, using transit, but that's the world that we're coming into and that's uh, where we need to be if we wanna solve the major challenges of mobility and equity in LA County. So thank you. Great, and now we will um, go to Dylan, who will tell us a little bit about VIA and what VIA has been doing to uh, adapt in these times. Thank, thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, we've seen a couple things. One, I think cities with uh, an on-demand service, as Josh pointed out, we've seen be able to move a lot more flexibly. So as sort of uh, the crisis un unfolded, um, social distancing and sort of cleanliness measures were put in place. We saw a lot of cities like LA that had an existing service that they were able to either repurpose um, or change the zone very, very quickly. So within inside of a week, uh, in LA's case, we're able to help them within food or essential goods delivery, as well as providing uh, changing what, what used to be a first mile, last mile service to provide interzone transportation for folks to get to things like pharmacies and supermarkets in a convenient and efficient way. Um, similarly with uh, the BBG in Berlin, we almost doubled the size of the zone and, and covered um, what ended up being about 75% of the hospitals in the city and uh, 
expanded the service to provide um, service for healthcare workers um, to get to and from work in, in a pretty reliable way. And so I think in general, we saw these cities, we worked with about 30 cities to repurpose uh, existing deployments around um, either essential worker or essential good transportation in a pretty short period of time, and then continue to evolve those services again, using uh, the technology infrastructure and sort of backbone that they had that were able to leverage. We saw some other cities that were able to move very quickly. Uh, and so in the case of like Abu Dhabi, for example, we launched a service with them in under a week. We were able to put uh, what ended up being close to 30 vehicles on the road to provide essential worker transport. Um, and again, it, they made some significant changes to their fixed route service. And so this was in response to that. Um, same thing in Madrid, where we just launched very recently healthcare worker service there um, to help some of these cities respond to what were pretty significant crises, both on the transportation front, uh, but also obviously on the healthcare front. Um, I think moving uh, sort of through the crisis into what's next, what we've seen is a lot of cities are using this as an opportunity to fix some structural um, issues that they may have had uh, previously or that they're forecasting now based on change demand. And as Josh pointed out, sort of the, the changing uh, funding landscape here um, in the United States, but also globally. And I think you look at cities like uh, Columbus, Ohio, we've worked with to help them repurpose vehicles and drivers from underperforming fixed routes. How can they change their network to either increase peak service uh, on trunk routes or expand the, the on-demand portion of their network? Similar conversations with Dubai about taking off-peak service and converting that to on-demand. Uh, in some cases, this will lead to pretty significant cost savings that can then be repurposed elsewhere and providing a much better rider experience. And so those two things together, coupled with the fact that technology uh, provides agencies and cities with the data, uh, the control and the visibility into what's going on in their network. So as you think about limiting capacity on fixed routes or, or in any vehicle, being able to get ridership data in some locations using this data for contact tracing, uh, if someone uh, ends up getting sick in places where uh, they're doing this in a, in a pretty regimented way. And so the only way you can do that is, is with technology. Some of the other conversations have been around labor and safety. So if you think about the drivers, obviously all of our thoughts are with the, the frontline workers who are out there every day and are exposed to, to pretty significant risks. Having the drivers uh, in some cases limit uh, ridership themselves on the vehicles puts them in a very difficult position and, and sort of having a driver turn over their shoulder every day to count how many people are on the bus um, in, in some cases was not sustainable. So using technology not only to allow people to either book a seat on a fixed route, but limit capacity um, in a more meaningful way. Um, I've seen a lot of interest in that. I think the other thing moving forward is how can cities, and Josh alluded to this before, but how can cities provide a more flexible um, and more efficient uh, sort of technology platform that'll allow them to adapt to future crises and change their network in a little more flexible way, um, while also ensuring this equity of access issue that I think is going to be really key as cities look at recovery, you look at the hardest hit communities in terms of income um, and their access to mass transit. I think this is something that, that, at least for us and for a lot of agencies and cities, is really first and forefront um, out of the recovery. How can you make sure that during a very tight budget situation, you're able to continue to provide equity of access to transportation? And so having these conversations where we look at where are we able to provide um, reliable transportation? Where can we augment a network that just doesn't have the capacity um, to expand fixed route or continue fixed route service into some of these underserved areas? Um, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you both so much. So there were a couple of themes that came up in both of um, what you were saying as well as a bunch of questions coming in from our participants who by the way you can continue to uh, submit questions and we'll go through them but let's start on the topic of equity which both of you talked about um, can you talk a little bit about how both LA Metro and VIA are able to um, set goals and then measure um, the equity considerations you have and if those have implications then for how you allocate funding or service or or other things moving forward? Yeah, I think we're not at the set goals and measure point yet. We got a long way to go on equity. Um, if you look at how our, uh, our board typically makes decisions, their concept of what equity means is geographic, right? They're, they're thinking about, well, which part of the county gets which money and how much. Um, what we're trying to do now is move them away from that definition of equity 
towards a definition of equity that is about trying to get the resources we have to the people who need it most. And we've done that in part by hiring an equity officer um, and by having an equity platform and starting to move that movement. Um, before we start calling the board directly by putting quantitative data in front of them and saying, hey, you're doing these things that are highly inequitable, so we need to change it. First, we have to get them to agree that there is a problem, that we've defined the problem in a way that they want to, to move forward with and recommend some specific actions they can take. And so we're at that point right now, all of the recovery task force recommendations are going through an equity assessment tool that our equity officer created in order to give the board a sense of how and why they are achieving the equity goals that we've put out there. Um, I don't think we're quite at the point of, of specific quantitative metrics yet. Got it. Dylan, is there uh, some, some metrics that he uses or other sort of methods of thinking about equity? And is, is that also sort of shifting like it, it sounds like they're working on a really not sure. I think I think for us the equity of access piece is sort of core to what we do. Um, we're a little different than some other providers in that you know our goal is to enable uh, LA Metro um, or Jersey City or Seattle to run their own service, and so we're working with them around what the goals of the service are, and our our uh, you know our task is to enable that using technology. And so a lot of the services that we run, particularly around first mile, mile last mile, are both. Um, from a geographic, as Josh pointed out, but also from an income perspective, uh, servicing areas that are just very underserved or economically challenged. And so first, um, providing first mile, last mile services, for example, or services in a transit desert, uh, transportation is the number one factor on folks in terms of economic empowerment. If they can get these jobs, they, they need to be able to have reliable transportation to get there. And so we work very closely with cities to make sure we can accomplish the goals and that we're running a service that meets them. And so whether it's making sure we've got um, uh, phone booking for folks who don't have access to a smartphone or can uh, either do cash or credit payments um, for folks who are underbanked or unbanked, um, un ensuring that we have access to the service for sort of the most at-risk populations is a key key part of what we do. Great. Um, and then here's a question I, I think also for both of you. It seems like there's been huge advantages, at least right now, as well as before the pandemic, to this partnership between a public transit agency and a private mobility um, provider and that there's things that you can do on one side that you can't do on the other and um, vice versa. But what about places where the public transit agency is not already partnered with a private mobility um, partnership? Do you have any recommendations of things they could do that can help reach some of the success that you guys were able to? And then maybe also, I know there are some places where there are more people who actually get around with VIA than um, the public transit provider as well. So are there things that VIA is able to do without the support of the public transit provider? So on, on both sides of that. Go ahead, Josh. No, I, I mean, look, I, I, we have an, an Office of Extraordinary Innovation that was set up by the CEO that has about 15 full-time employees. I report directly to the CEO and setting up and continuing this partnership with VIA has been probably one of the most painful things I've done at Metro. So just to kind of emphasize for people who are not in the industry, how difficult it is to do. There are a litany of reasons why it is difficult. Uh, one of which just being it's different and public agencies aren't used to doing things different. Another, of course, being labor unions and their concerns. Another, of course, being the board members and their concerns. There are so many obstacles to doing this that for me to say, well, it's, you know, here, here's how and why you should do it is, is a little bit um, naive, right? And, you know, I do believe in it. I think it was worth it. I think it's part of the longer term uh, battle we have to fight to change how this industry does business, but it takes a tremendous amount of support from the top of the agency to even have a shot at it. Yeah, I, I would add, I think, again, we're a little different in that we're not running a own service sort of in cooperation with LA Metro. Um, this is their service. We're there with technology to help enable their goals. And so we tend to come in from the beginning. And obviously, as Josh pointed out, every city is different. Their goals are different. But 
there's no opportunity sort of for us to succeed where the city fails. So understanding these goals, doing simulations, working with them both on, you know, as Josh pointed out, uh, st stakeholder management internally, but also with riders, um, making sure that the service we're going to roll out and the, the capabilities that we're going to enable really meet their needs is really important to us. And so we spend a lot of time uh, up front with cities of all sizes, you know, ranging from Lone Tree, Colorado to, to LA Metro um, to make sure we can accomplish sort of these mobility goals and that it's we're doing it in a sustainable way. And so to understand the funding model, uh, understand the ridership goals, and most cities have, obviously the financials are very important, but most cities have also some qualitative goals as well, whether it's equity of access, um, modal shift, there are a lot of other second uh, secondary goals that we can help to enable with cities, but I think coming in with a true, you know, we, we call this side of the business sort of our, our partnerships business, but it's because really there's no opportunity, again, for us to succeed where the city fails. We're really true partners, and I think it's a very different approach than some other companies have taken where we're not looking to sort of enable a separate service and, and take people off of mass transit or compete with mass transit. In many cases, Arlington, Texas, we operate their service for them uh, and VIA is the mass transit network, right? It's Arlington on demand powered by VIA um, and we've worked with them to expand and provide a, a pretty comprehensive service, do this in West Sacramento as well uh, and a variety of other cities. And so, you know, it really, um, it's this sort of mutual partnership both to make sure we can accomplish these goals and do it in a sustainable way. Excellent. Um, so there's a couple questions here about some more of the specifics of the services um, that you guys talked about. So uh, for example, moving forward with public health concerns and trying to think about social distancing, trying to have a lot of people in a small amount of space, which is what we usually strive for in more efficient transportation is not the best move moving forward. So are there any um, changes in some of the, the big, bigger like capital investments? So things like um, either LA Metro bus sizes um, or via, via vehicle sizes. I know that's in some places you have vans, in some places you have sedans. You also have to think about when we go back to equity issues, whether or not they're wheelchair accessible. Um, have there been any changes to your, your rolling stock considerations um, based on this flexibility that you were both talking about? And, how to consider that? Uh, Josh, I'm happy to start with this one. I, I think, you know, for us, again, we've both come in with um, new vehicles. We've repurposed existing vehicles in several cases uh, during the course of sort of the, the, the um, COVID-19 crisis here. We've had significantly expanded some services. We can use any vehicle on the platform. The sort of the algorithm is as agnostic. We're booking the seats. And so being able to have, again, this flexibility, as Josh pointed out, to bring in full-size buses. Um, in some cases, we've operated with double-decker buses. We, we've used uh, all-size vehicles really to meet those needs. And um, it's really around the use case. Of how can we most efficiently and obviously safely, in this case, um, provide transportation? So we're working both at the state and local and national level um, in, the, in the 23 countries that we operate with local uh, health regula uh, regulators to make sure we're meeting those needs, whether it's requiring riders to put on masks, uh, more rigorous and sort of publicized cleaning schedule, providing, uh, helping agencies or cities provide guidance to riders, right? So you have this in-app communication you can have with riders to provide them regular updates, regular guidance. You can do uh, self-check-ins on health. Um, so there's a lot you can do sort of using technology as a communication tool, but then also flexibly respond to, um, you know, the, uh, the requirements on the ground. Some cities uh, don't allow barriers between drivers and riders. Other cities are mandating them. So we, it's, uh, it's all about sort of being able to provide a flexible solution to meet these needs. Yeah, and I, I would echo a lot of that. I mean, look, we're, we're seeing already that about 99% of our riders are complying with our mask, mandatory mask policy. Um, you know, masks are the number one thing we can do to reduce transmission on, on uh, public transit. That's becoming more and more apparent. I think the likelihood of us keeping social distancing on public transit is, is just uh, not going to happen. It's not a very likely outcome. And uh, to the extent we can do it and reduce crowding, which I think makes people very nervous and is unpleasant under any circumstances, uh, we can increase the frequency of our uh, buses um, when we have bus priority. And when we don't have bus priority, you have to run a lot of buses that get bunched up and crowded with lots of people. When you have bus priority and they flow freely, you have less crowding. So that's one of the most important things we can do. But the other thing that we're doing is and we're looking at how can we reward the behavior 
that we want to see. The behavior we want to see is we want people to not drive along, right? And otherwise, we're pretty much agnostic about which mode they're using. So if they're not driving alone, how can we provide an incentive for that? And that can include not going anywhere, telecommuting. That can include riding a bike. That can include walking. There's many, many ways we can we can do things besides uh, the way we've done them previously. And so we're trying to work with employers around the region to figure out how can we offer some of those incentives so that we're not just relying totally on transit to bear all the, uh, the brunt of moving people. I would just add one thing onto that. I think um, you know, that's a good point, Josh. We've seen a lot of uh, different cities or uh, countries at the national level um, try to address this. In Israel, we're launching a national mass app with ILON, which is the National Highway Administration, where we're basically uh, looking at the gamification of transportation. And so awarding points based on uh, capacity on different um, uh, different transportation modes. And so at the end of the year, um, they've uh, allocated a pretty significant amount of money to be able to convert those those points but to cash on the system and so really sort of you know putting their money where their mouth is so to speak um, and, and allowing riders to gain points by using sort of underutilized or more available modes of transit during uh, peak times yeah I, I think that's uh, I know there's some programs here in the US there is a an RPE funded project a number of number of years ago on that as well so I think definitely something that could be interesting uh, looking at moving forward and and We'd love to hear how, how that works in LA as you continue to do at Joshua. Um, so as you're making all of these changes, and some of these are changes in incentivizing people how to move and getting them comfortable on bicycles, maybe it's introducing VIA into neighborhoods where they didn't have as many transportation opportunities before. You also mentioned, Joshua, that it is installing sort of um, bus lanes, bus priority, um, TSP signals. Um, what has the public response generally been to that and how have you been dealing with negative public response to change which whenever there's change there's always going to be people unhappy with it i mean i don't know what it's like in the rest of the country really but in la uh, there's a tremendous openness to change right now among the general public um and uh, the and a, and a growing realization among even the elected officials that the status quo was unacceptable in many, many ways beyond transportation. And that's a time when change can occur. Right now, our biggest barriers to change uh, primarily lie within the organization and within the board members of the organization who are gonna be slower to come around than the general public. And our job is to bring them around and get people to realize that this moment of change is unlike anything that they've seen before and make sure that we maximize um, that this opportunity to do something because we have a responsibility to do that. It is not okay to just say, well, let's make some changes around the margins and do a few improvements here and there uh, coming out of this. This is too big of a shift for us to, to miss the, the opportunity to make a dramatic difference in terms of the equity and mobility and environmental outcomes from our, our transportation system. Yeah, I, I'd add a couple of things there too. I, I think um, I think the communication and sort of how agencies and cities have communicated with their riders has mattered a ton. And, and I think, um, again, having this channel where you can directly communicate with your riders, um, not only upfront, but sort of ongoing as things change, as you look to make continuous modifications to your system, um, and we work very closely with cities and agencies on this. You can have a perfect service, but if the rollout isn't communicated effectively and correctly uh, to your riders, it really has a big, uh, it's really a detrimental effect um, all around. Um, so that's one. I think the other, and Josh is a far more of an expert on this than I am, but looking at increased funding at the federal level, whether it be formula funding or how agencies and cities can use federal funding that comes through, I think is um, uh, another area where we've probably got some work to do um, as, as cities and agencies look how they're going to ramp back up their networks, giving them maximum flexibility, obviously, is another um, uh, another area. That's a timely recommendation, too, with all the changes in um requirements for the federal funding coming out in these recent recovery packages and uh, it could be that there's some opportunities there that, that transportation providers can, can come on to. And I, I actually want to ask a quick follow-up. Dylan, you said that communication is very important. How do you do good communication? How do you know if you're doing it well and what does that consist of? 
Yeah, I think you know communication works both. Ways. Um, one of the advantages of having an advantage is having reach. You know who's writing what, and you can reach them, um, you know, very quickly. But you also get feedback. Um, and so, in a lot so of our services, we're carrying a small journey of um, riders relative to the overall population of the city or rider population. But the feedback uh, that agencies and cities get via the app um, is pretty significant. And so, they're able to, they're not used to getting feedback at this volume on fixed route or light rail, um, but being able to have a technology channel where you can either do surveys with riders, you can reach out to active riders and be able to get feedback or riders who, um, you know, maybe advocates. Uh, and so it just gives you a different channel to engage these riders to, to provide more incremental feedback. It's not, you're not providing this in stone, you're able to sort of update as you go. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question. I know we're reaching the end of time here. Um, Joshua, I think you very astutely pointed out that a lot of these changes aren't only beneficial um, in times of a pandemic, but hopefully a lot of the changes that we're making right now are also going to be beneficial moving forward. Nobody wants to be stuck on an overcrowded bus. Um, ideally, congestion goes down, not up, and air quality, noise pollution, et cetera. Um, do you think it will be easy to maintain these changes? What challenges are we going to have once you know things start changing back? People's travel patterns start uh, changing from the staying at home all of the time. Um, in in what ways are we going to be struggling to maintain these positive changes, and how can we make sure that that we don't regress back into the the less desirable transportation systems that that we are right now pushing to improve? I mean, look, there are lots of entrenched interests that would like us, even if they won't say it explicitly, would like us to go back to what we had before because it was profitable for them. And trying to prevent that is uh, is going to be a difficult uh, thing to do no matter what. Um, I think what we've seen so far in terms of change is that it's been uh, there's been a lot of symbolic change um, and not as much substantive change that's been happening. And translating the symbolic change into substantive change is the challenge for transit agencies around the country because it's very easy to say, well, we're gonna do this differently and this is gonna be better. And to focus on the things that are in the news that people are most you know, thinking about because that's what's in the news. It's a lot harder to say, well, if we really wanna look at equity, what is it that is in, unequal in our society right now? What is it that we want to make uh, a difference in? And, and I think calling that out explicitly gives us a shot at making that change. And that's why we've been delivering the message and mostly internally so far, but eventually externally, that the system we had before was not an equitable system. And if you care about change, if you care about equity, if you're marching in the streets for those things, transportation is one of the places we can point to where it has to change if we want to fulfill the promise uh, of what, what protesters are essentially asking for. And we're gonna make that case as explicitly and as openly as we can, and hope that it sticks and hope that elected officials have to respond to it. Great. All right, well, we are three minutes over. And so in order to be respectful of everybody's time, I want to thank everybody for joining us and especially thank Joshua and Dylan for your insights and your expertise for having this conversation with us this afternoon. Um, for everybody, our next webinar is going to be tomorrow. Uh, welcome to the you know, series of webinar, Work From Home. Um, and this will be part of Eno's Road to Recovery series, and it will be a behavioral science lens on transportation in a COVID and post-COVID environment. You can all register for that on our website, enotrans.org, where you can also find our uh, research reports, including reports about the partnership between LA Metro Sound Transit in King County Metro with VIA and this first mile, last mile service that they had uh, getting people to and from train stations that has been adapting along with our current environment. And at our website, you can also sign up for Eno Transportation Weekly, our weekly newsletter and invaluable source on all things transportation. I hope everybody stays healthy, stays civically engaged in transportation and beyond and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all again. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Alice. All right, thanks. Bye.